Good afternoon. This is the beginning of Chapter 3. Uh, so the first thing that we are going to talk about in Chapter 3 are the characteristics of ecosystems. And then we're going to parlay, parlay that into how do the characteristics of ecosystems affect the survival of organisms and the types of organisms that exist there. So we're going to start off by talking about biotic and abiotic characteristics, like the title suggests. Biotic, like we saw in Chapter 2, means living. Abiotic means non-living. And so what we're saying is, if we were to take an ecosystem, there are things that are living in the ecosystem, basically all of the other organisms that you find. And there are things that are not living. Water, minerals, perhaps the sun, anything that has to do with uh, not just whether or not they're present, but the amount that's present. So when we're talking about water, we could talk about amount, we could talk about temperature. Uh, so we're not just talking about is it present, yes or no, but maybe some sort of qualifying characteristic. How much of it is present, what's its temperature, what's its quality. So the first thing that I'd like for us to do is take a look at a question that actually comes from your textbook. It's on page 78. And the question is asking you, try to think of some biotic and abiotic components in the ecosystem of a pronghorn, a human, and a starfish. So I'm suggesting that you make a little chart like this one. We'll put abiotic here and biotic there. Now, right now, if you don't know what a pronghorn is, maybe you want to take out your textbook, page 78. Let's see, there's a little picture of it. But take a few minutes and see if you can list a couple of characteristics or components of an ecosystem that are biotic and abiotic for each of these organisms. Now, hopefully you had some time to think and you came up with some ideas. I'm going to put just some suggestions up here on the screen to try to illustrate the different kinds of components that we could put. If I'm talking about a pronghorn, I might want to think about what its, whoops, I'm putting that on the wrong side, what its predator is. I'll erase this. Now, even if you're unsure of the exact name of an organism, you can use this type of relationship description to describe a biotic component. Whatever the predator is for a pronghorn, maybe a big mountain cat of some sort, would, have, would be a biotic component of its environment. Perhaps an abiotic component of the environment would be water availability. So how much fresh water is available? Perhaps another abiotic component would be a rock slide, because they're living on mountains, and so that would be a potential uh, abiotic component. Now notice uh, that some of the abiotic components might not be present all the time. It might be a unique event that happens only once in a while, like this rock slide. Now I put a bunch of things that might uh, affect it in a negative way. Perhaps another biotic factor would be its prey. How much of its prey is available? Lots of prey is probably good. Uh, for the pronghorn. Now, a lot of organisms in that category tend to be more of a herbivore, so we could even just say food source. Now, the food source, source is either going to be a plant, which is another organism. Remember, plants are organisms, not just animals. Or it could be another animal. But either way, it's a biotic component. Now, if we talk about humans, what are some abiotic components in our environment? Well, let's put the sun here. The sun uh, gives you a tan, uh, but also it helps you produce vitamin D, so that's a very useful thing. Uh, another abiotic component in our environment would be the oxygen content of the air. That's why people don't live on the tops of mountains, because there's less oxygen for us to breathe there. Now, how about some biotic components? Why don't we put a parasite, for example, a tick, for example, a mosquito, something that is irritating to us. That could definitely be uh, a biotic factor. How about 
other humans. So it can be our same species or it can be a different species. It just has to be another organism. For the starfish, for abiotic factors, uh, we could say things about tides. They live in the water, and so maybe the movement of the ocean uh, will change at different times of the year and different times of the day, and that will affect their movement. Maybe we could say salt content, because that will affect the density of the water and whether or not things can float. In the biotic section, maybe we want to put here something like a bacteria or something that could give it an infection or a disease. That is another organism. It doesn't have to be another organism that it is eating or that is eating it. It can also be a microorganism here. We could also put in this particular category, I'm going to put humans. Now, humans could go realistically anywhere. We are in the ecosystem of pretty much everything because we are building our houses all over the place. But the idea is that I've put some other organism that exists in its ecosystem in some capacity. So our goal for the next little section here is to define and explain the interrelationship among four words. Species, population, community, and ecosystem. Ecosystem is the really big, broad term, whereas species is the much more specific, much more defined term. So we're going to start with species and sort of work our way up to ecosystem. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about what an ecologist would study if he was trying to study this particular level. So if an ecologist were trying to study a species, we would be focusing on members of a population that can reproduce together and make fertile offspring. I'm going to give you an example to illustrate when a species is and isn't there. I have a horse. I have a donkey. They are different species, but they can reproduce together to make a mule. The mule cannot produce, cannot, is not fertile. And so we would not say that the mule is a new species because it cannot reproduce. Now, in any case, when we found a species of organisms that can reproduce together, and we'd like to study just the species, then we're focusing on individual organisms, and we're focusing on their adaptations. What does an organism have that allows it to live where it lives? Or why does an organism live where it lives? So I have two examples here that I'd like to use to illustrate it. The key idea is that it's usually uh, something to do with an abiotic condition. A lot, a lot, that's a French word. Uh, when we're talking about a species, we're talking about just one type of organism. We're not really talking about interactions yet between it and other organisms. So we really have to focus on abiotic conditions. Over here, we have a flower. The flower is called, I don't know why this looks so small, but it's Old Man of the Mountain. It's just a fun name. Uh, but it's a flower that lives, like its name suggests, in the mountains. So it is adapted for cold. It is adapted for dry weather because that's the conditions that you find in its environment. So what we see is that an organism uh, will have to adapt to the abiotic conditions of its environment. Another really good example are these snails over here that live near springs. Specifically, these are the Banff spring snails. They require quite a bit of heat and sulfur to survive, uh, and so they're adapted for that. So some organisms have adaptations that require specific abiotic conditions, and this will help us determine the distribution of these organisms. Distribution means where the organism lives, and it's almost always based on the abiotic conditions that are around it. Next level is population. A population is when you have members of the same species 
in an area at a time together. So now we are talking about a whole bunch of organisms, but still the same species. So instead of focusing on an individual organism and its adaptations, we will focus on the population, its size, its nature. So literally, how many members are there? And how many differences do they have? For example, over here, we have some plants. A lot of plants are seasonal, meaning that uh, they grow only during one part of the year. Uh, and then their population would change in size depending on what time of the year we're in. So I have a bunch of lilies in my yard, like this is illustrating, uh, and they're perennials, which means they come back every year. But uh, they only grow from, you know, right about now, mid-April or end of April and May, uh, till the end of the summer. And then my lilies do not grow and their population basically drops off to nothing during the winter. So my plants that are seasonal show a change in size. Uh, an example of an animal that is seasonal is this collared pika. Uh, its story is on page 80 of your textbook, so I'll just pause here so that you can take a look at it. So after having read a little bit about the pika, you can see that changes in temperature seem to have affected its population size for a number of reasons food source uh, insulation. We could also investigate the nature of the population. In other words, how much variety is there? Now you'll notice that's a picture of a bunch of people's hands. They're obviously people who have different colors of skin, but also different sizes of hands, illustrating you know, different genders, different ages. Uh, and so we're talking about what kind of variety do we have in the population? Not just how many are there, but what kind of variety do we have? That's what an ecologist would study if they were studying a population. If an ecologist were studying a community, well, now we would have populations, plural, of different organisms. So we've moved from one organism to a bunch of the same organism to now groups of different organisms. So now we can start having discussions about how many populations are there. So what kind of diversity is there? Are there many populations? Or are there a small number of populations? So for example, I might consider what would I find in a whole forest versus what do I find in a small fragment of a forest? Then I would ask myself, how do populations interact? So a main idea would be competition. You'll see the arrow points over here. I could have competition within a species. For example, two males uh, competing for the attention of a female so they can reproduce. Or I could have competition between species. So this is a lion and a hyena obviously competing for the carcass of an animal that they would both like to use as food. We could have predator-prey interactions, like we mentioned before. And there could also be abiotic factors still, like moisture and sunlight, that will affect how many populations there are and how many interactions can exist between them. Now, an ecosystem, like we said, is the big, broad level. So what is an ecosystem? It's the biotic and abiotic components of an environment. So now we're not just talking about one organism or a group of the same organism or a bunch of different organisms. We're talking about all the organisms and all the abiotic factors. Now, an ecosystem because it has so many things involved, it's hard to explain unless we start really from the beginning. So the example that I have over here is after a forest fire. After a forest fire, mo most things are dead. So we're starting an ecosystem more or less from scratch. This means that an organism that lives well in open state spaces will establish itself first, maybe some plants. These plants will create shade and alter the soil. 
and this will make the environment more suitable for other organisms to show up. So if we take this example of the ecosystem starting all over again, not only do organisms affect what other organisms live there, but so do abiotic conditions like shade and soil. A key idea is that environments change over time. If one thing in the environment, whether it's a species or a population or a community or some other biotic or abiotic factor changes inside of an ecosystem, it can make the environment more or less suitable for other organisms. And we'll see that our next topic will really be what are things that cause organisms uh, to be able to survive or not to survive. Now, if you take a look down here, I just made a little chart showing uh, what we're really focused on. A species is really a biotic thing because we're talking about one organism. A population is still a biotic thing because we're talking about many of one organism. A community is still a biotic thing because we are talking about many populations. And an ecosystem comprises biotic and abiotic characteristics. Now don't confuse that with what affects them. A species can be affected by abiotic characteristics, but when I ask what a species is, that's a biotic thing. Now when we're talking about ecosystems, there are different types, obviously. In general, we could say we have terrestrial or water ecosystems. In water ecosystems, don't forget that there would really be two types, salt water and fresh water. So am I in the ocean or am I in a lake? Uh, and those types of ecosystems are distinctively different enough. You generally don't find organisms that live in lakes that also live in the ocean or vice versa. Uh, each ecosystem, though, can have distinct parts. And so don't think of it as an ecosystem as being just a static thing that has one set of characteristics. I'll use the example over here of vertical stratification in forests. If I look at a forest, there are some distinct levels. There is what is on the ground that has one set of abiotic and biotic characteristics. And then there's the middle strata that has different characteristics. And then there's the upper strata that has even different biotic and abiotic characteristics. So within an ecosystem, there are different regions that will have different characteristics. So we could even call these little mini subsections of ecosystems. The same would be true in water ecosystems. If we take a look at depth and proximity to shore, there are distinct regions in an ocean ecosystem. And the same is true when we talk about freshwater. How deep are we and how close are we to shore gives different characteristics because of the biotic and abiotic factors that exist there. And that's it for today.